Previously on the history and evolution of Dragon Ball games. The big guns, the big investment was already on the next console, the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. But before we get to that, the Tenkaichi series would suffer the same fate as the Budokai series. It dropped from the PlayStation 2 to the PSP with Tenkaichi Tag Team. It was pretty much Tenkaichi, but both you and your teammate would fight against the enemy at the same time. Both characters would be on screen, and if the enemy had a teammate as well, they would all be on screen. So it was the Tenkaichi system, but with four characters fighting simultaneously. Obviously, this could get chaotic and confusing very fast. But it wasn't a bad game by any means. It was also the last game on the PSP, and it was not the worst way to close that chapter especially given that it followed Dragon Ball Evolution, which... Sheesh. Speaking of handheld consoles, this was also the prime time for Dragon Ball games on the Nintendo DS. We've already talked about Super Sonic Warriors 2, which was the first game on the platform, but it sure as hell wasn't the last. What followed it was Harukanaru Densetsu, which was a strike of nostalgia. If you remember the first Dragon Ball games ever made, they were RPGs that used cards in a turn-based battle system. They used game boards to move characters around, and those same cards as dice rolls. Harukanaru Densetsu was a return to that Goku Den style of game. A style that had already failed previously, but now with better technology, it was worth Worth revisiting. The game was a huge success in Japan. In the West, though, not so much. So what followed was also an RPG, but instead of that slow pace, instead of the turn-based battles, it had an action-oriented playstyle, and it heavily relied on the DS's touch capabilities. Dragon Ball Origins was the first non-Dragon Ball Z game in a very long time. It was developed by Game Republic, a new developer in the Dragon Ball games universe. Using the touch screen, you would move Goku and make him fight, solve puzzles, and play through part of the original Dragon Ball story, and just opposite to the previous game, this one was a success in the West, but not so much in Japan. The sequel, Dragon Ball Origins 2, continued the story of the original Dragon Ball, added a few mechanics, and it was in general a step up from the previous game. But it sold a lot less, which made it hard to justify a third game in this style. The developer Game Republic wasn't done though, they shifted style and grabbed another classic Dragon Ball series that had been dead for almost 15 years, and that's the Butoden series. Ultimate Butoden had a lot of of interesting mechanics. When performing combos, the game would slow down as the enemy pressed some defensive buttons. It could be countering, it could be dodging, so it created these intense moments where both players were reacting and counterattacking each other. And the game was well received too. And finally, before we say goodbye to the Nintendo DS, we have one last game to talk about. Dragon Ball Z Attack of the Saiyans by Monolith Soft, who you might know as the developer of the Xenoblade Chronicles series. So, as you might expect, this was a JRPG, a very traditional JRPG that had you play through the Piccolo Jr. saga up till the Dragon Ball Z Saiyan saga. And with that, we close the book on the Nintendo DS. On another Nintendo platform, the Wii, Dragon Ball was also breathing its last breath, with Dragon Ball Revenge of King Piccolo, the only Dragon Ball game exclusive to the Wii. This was a side-scroller beat-em-up focused once more on the story of the original Dragon Ball. It was like an enhanced version of the Game Boy Advance title, Advanced Adventures, but utilizing the Wii's power, beautiful graphics, Graphics, wonderful animation, platforming, boss fights. It was a pretty complete package, even though it ended up being received with mixed reviews. And having closed the book on the PSP, Nintendo DS and the Wii, it's time to wrap up another platform, the arcades, which were largely exclusive to Japan. First, this was a turning point for the Data Card S series, as they released Dragon Ball Heroes. The collectible card game series started introducing story arcs, which were very well received by the community as they showcased different versions of the characters we loved, like Future Trunks achieving Super Saiyan 3. It continued exploring concepts, what-if scenarios, all with original animation. It gave us player Avatar, something that was also extremely novel at the time. The game was so popular that it ended up on the 3DS, so rest assured, even though the game is done on the arcades, we're not done talking about it. Roughly at the same time, another arcade game was coming out, and it would stick around for years to come. Dragon Ball Zenkai Battle Royale, which recently received an update, and was kind of revived simply as Zenkai Battle. The game itself uses a similar fighting system to Tenkaichi, but not only has a 2v2 game mode, like Tenkaichi Tag Team had, it also has a Battle Royale mode with a 4-player free-for-all. With its big roster of characters, it quickly gained popularity, and it's still played to this day, so even though it was the last game on arcades so far at least, maybe it was the last because it came to stay. And while we've closed the book on a lot of platforms, new doors were also being opened. 
finally in 2010, almost 25 years into the history of Dragon Ball games, the PC was getting its own game, Dragon Ball Online. The premise was something out of this world and it filled us with excitement. An open world RPG where you could create your own Dragon Ball character, explore the world, learn your favorite abilities, interact with your favorite characters. The end product was not so exciting though. It was the most bare bones MMORPG that you could imagine. It was like an alpha version of World of Warcraft with a Dragon Ball skin. The traditional MMO combat, the repetitive quest design, the empty world, all of that made it extremely mediocre. And the game ended up never leaving the Asian market. Despite before release, a lot of people were asking for it to be brought over. Those requests slowly died after the game came out. But let's get back to the big boys, talk about the biggest Dragon Ball games on the biggest platforms. The new console generation had just been released with the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. And with it came a bunch of new Dragon Ball games, though for the most part, this generation lacked a bit in innovation. Most of the games were mere evolutions of previous concepts, or completely new concepts that just weren't quite good enough. First up was Dimps, with Dragon Ball Z Burst Limit, and they made what Dimps was used to making at this point, an evolution of their Budokai series. This next generation took the graphics to the next level, so during matches you had some really good looking cutscenes. You could equip items called drama pieces, which would trigger specific events during a match. It felt like a fun cinematic experience, and that's not even to mention the best loading screens in a Dragon Ball game ever made. The game was heavily criticized for lacking innovation, after all, it was basically another Budokai. But in general, it received positive reviews. So it might surprise you when I say that this was actually the last Budokai game. Dimps ended the series on a high note and was now focused on developing other projects. And the reins of this generation fell to another developer, Spike. The makers behind Tenkaichi also brought that series and revamped it to the new generation with Raging Blast and Raging Blast 2. Raging Blast was a big step for Bandai Namco in North America, at least business-wise. Previously, a lot of Dragon Ball games were published with the help of Atari, who actually held the Dragon Ball license in the US. It was around this time that Bandai Namco was able to fully acquire the license and now freely publish Dragon Ball games both in Japan and the US. And that's how that partnership came to an end. As for the game, Raging Blast, it was a step down from Burst Limit. Sure, there was something there for fans who preferred Tenkaichi over Budokai, there were more characters, more abilities, but as usual, it all came at the cost of game mechanics, which were fully recycled from the PlayStation 2 games. And some didn't transition very well. The camera had loads of issues, you spent half the time spinning that left thumbstick trying to get up. Also, if Burst Limit had an awesome cinematic feel to it, when you were watching cutscenes in the middle of a fight, Raging Blast was incredibly rough. And Raging Blast 2, which came out the following year, didn't do much to improve. Some of the gameplay was polished, but they completely gave up on storytelling by giving you a series of fights for each character instead of a story mode. The fan service was certainly there, with dialogue between specific characters, a ton of characters to select from, lots of transformations and fusions and all of that, but it wasn't enough to conceal how shallow the rest of the game was. The world had moved past Tenkaichi, this was no longer enough. So Spike tried something else, Ultimate Tenkaichi. Welcome to Cutscenes, the video game. The combat system was completely different, but you watch the game more than you play it. You initiate a combo and then choose which button you want to press for a follow-up. And if the opponent guesses the same as you, he blocks it and you have to start over. Everything had a minigame, throwing supers, key blasts, countering opponents. And the idea wasn't inherently bad, it made for a more casual game, but it all relied on luck a bit too much. You just had to guess which button the opponent was gonna press in order to avoid it. There was no other way of doing it. But the game did do something right. It gave players the option of creating a character. For the first time in the Western market, players could create their own Dragon Ball avatar. It wasn't the first game to do this overall, Dragon Ball Online did it first, but that stayed in Asia, so this was new to a lot of people. And even though the options were limited, players were excited to make their own character, to customize their own abilities and play through an original story where they were the stars of the show. Spike's next game would happen a year later, after they fused with Chunsoft. And from that fusion came Dragon Ball Z, for Connect, the only Dragon Ball game exclusive to the Xbox 
Xbox 360. So take our previous game, Ultimate Tenkaichi, with its long cutscenes in the middle of a battle, constantly stopping the action in favor of cinematics, and make the game first person with motion controls using the Kinect. That's the kind of game we have here. The game was obviously very poorly received as it was repetitive, the motion controls were bad, and Spike Chunsoft after dragging Tenkaichi through the mud during this generation, and then coming up with this game for the Kinect, they never developed another Dragon Ball game again. Coincidence? Who knows? Finally, before we close this generation, a new developer tried their hand at a Dragon Ball game, with Battle of Z by Artink. This was their first and their last Dragon Ball game. And it was a very different type of game. An arena brawler where you would fly around the field and sometimes fight multiple enemies at the same time. It led up to eight players fight at any given point with a team of four players who could share their energy and heal each other, as well as sync up and perform cooperative attacks. The game was awkward and repetitive to play in general, but it focused on online team play, cooperative and competitive. And despite the mixed reception, it wouldn't be the last time that we would see this concept in a Dragon Ball game. But that's a story for another time. Thank you for watching part 5 of the history and evolution of Dragon Ball games. If you've missed any of our previous videos, check out the playlist up there. If you're in the mood for something else, there's also the video at the bottom. But as always, thank you very much for watching. My name is Globku, and I'll see you guys next time. Boy.